On my way here this morning, as I was driving through this, this lovely, beautiful morning, I was working out a little resentment that was going on in my head. You know how you get a little resentment, kind of kind of digs in there, swirls around a little bit. I was working up a pretty good head of steam. Man, I told somebody off. In my car, I was driving, hands on the wheel, you know, but poof, I had it going. Felt really good, felt good. And then at a stoplight, getting pretty close to the society here, I wondered how I could use the lesson that I'm trying to teach this morning and apply it to myself. Using the metaphor of the labyrinth to help me center myself in this situation. So I want to use my story as an example of what I mean. But first, I want to give a little background about the labyrinth. Tell you what I'm, what I'm talking about a little bit. So, some of you may be familiar with the labyrinth as a walking path, and some of you may know the labyrinth as uh, the 1986 movie uh, starring David Bowie, right? When I first said I was going to do this, uh, I think they thought I was going to do a little movie review, right? Um, that labyrinth of the movie, a charming movie, a collaboration between George Lucas and Jim Henson, with these Muppet-like characters, these, these goblins, um, involves a maze. And a maze, the way I'm using it, is a puzzle to be solved, like a corn maze, right? You go in and there are blind alleys and uh, lots of twists and turns, and you have to figure out your way to the center and figure out your way out. That, in, for my uses today, that's a maze. I am talking about a labyrinth. A labyrinth in this use came to uh, popularity as a spiritual practice, a mindfulness practice in the 1990s, and it is a unicursal path, one path into the center and the same path out again. That's what I'm talking about, about a labyrinth. Now, this renewal of uh, this as a mindfulness practice or a spiritual practice uh, was led by the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artress at Grace Episcopal Cathedral in San Francisco in the, in the early to mid-90s. So this is a little bit about where these ancient symbols, I'll show you some images shortly of these ancient symbols that are used as a, as a, a spiritual practice. There's a story in mythology that I think is useful to tease out maze from labyrinth. And that's the, the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus and the Minotaur. There was a great palace in Crete built by King Minos. And he had Daedalus, you may remember Daedalus's name, he created the wings for Icarus, he was a, an engineer and a creator. Daedalus created the great maze underneath the palace, and in this maze lived the Minotaur, this creature that was half bull and half man, and Every few years, the other nations of Greece sent young uh, teenagers as a tribute to be eaten by the Minotaur. Oh, smelly and dark. Oh, so smelly down there. Can you imagine? All closed up, dark, and there were bones on the ground, crunchy. Oh, the bad place. Well, one year, Theseus, Theseus was among the youth that were sent to Crete to, be, uh, to give their lives, to appease this Minotaur. But he thought he had a plan, and he was full of himself and also full of the will to fight. And so as he was just about to go in to the, the great gates of the, 
uh, labyrinth were about to open and he was about to go into this maze, he saw Ariadne. Ariadne was the uh, daughter of the king and she was standing on a bridge up above and she had talked to Daedalus because she had had her eye on Theseus, you see. And so she, Daedalus had given her a golden ball of thread and the idea was that whoever had that golden ball of thread could drop it and take the thread along, drop the end of it and take the thread along and, and then could find their way back out. So Ariadne drops the ball of golden thread over off the bridge and Theseus catches it. A little wink perhaps. And goes in with the other tributes, goes into the labyrinth and it's dark and it's smelly and it's crunchy. And he drops the end of the ball of thread and as he goes in, it creates a pathway for him and he finds his way to the Minotaur. He's able to slay the Minotaur, that's a whole other part of the story, won't spend a lot of time there, but because he can find his way out again, it makes it from a maze to a unicursal path, a labyrinth, do you see? Because he's got the key, the clue to come back out again. I love that story. There's a lot in it. And it tells us that we can project onto the labyrinth whatever psycho story is going on with us. Life and death, uh, grief and joy, desire, all of the things are possible around that. So here are some images of the labyrinth. The first one is the Cretan labyrinth. This is a seven circuit labyrinth. If you count the rings, you'll see seven circuits. And this dates from about 3,000 years ago. The first place that we find it is inside a tomb. And there's some idea that it is the pathway for the soul to get out of the tomb and, and go to uh, heaven or to an afterlife. Then it began to spread around as sort of graffiti. And if I teach you how to draw it, you can always draw it. There's this little, cute little trick to drawing it, and, and you can always draw it. In medieval times, the next slide, labyrinths begin to appear in churches and cathedrals. Here are three from Northern Europe. And the idea was that people were called out of their faith to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, right? You've heard this about needing to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Most people couldn't do that. It was too far, it was too dangerous, it was too expensive. It was fraught with, with problems. And so this stood in as a metaphor for a pilgrimage. You would take one path, you would walk this path into the center and the same path all the way out again. This next image is a large turf labyrinth uh, from Saffron Walden in Essex in England. It's huge. It's about 130 feet across, and it's been there since the 1800s. And the, and the people of the town, it's near the town green, and they, and they keep it uh, trimmed. I've walked this labyrinth. It's pretty fun uh, to walk that one. And this image is the most classic version of the labyrinth from the stone floor of Chartres Cathedral in France. It was built in the 13th century. It is still used today by pilgrims, mostly now American pilgrims who come to sort of pay homage to this original design. The first time I saw this image was at First Universalist Church. There's a lively labyrinth ministry there. And I'm sure that I had never seen it before. I'm positive that I had never seen it before. And I said, oh, yes, that image. There's something really archetypal about it that, that landed with me. And for many years, I had a practice of walking the labyrinth pretty regularly. There are many, many labyrinths of different designs, several of the Chartres style labyrinth uh, that are here in the Twin Cities. 
And so uh, in, in fair weather or in foul, you can find places to walk the labyrinth. There's something called the Worldwide Labyrinth Locator. You can put in there and find where there are labyrinths in your area. And we are labyrinth rich in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota. So one way that many people walk the labyrinth is to think of it as a three-fold path, a three-fold path. You walk in releasing whatever is going on in your head, right? Let's say you have a question, how will I respond to so-and-so about that um, challenge that I have? How will I navigate this grief? How will I um, get my mojo back? I don't know, whatever it is, right? And you can walk in releasing that out of your mind, if you like, releasing. You get into the center. Remember, you don't have to, there's no puzzle to it. You're walking one way in. You get to the center and stay as long as you like and perhaps receive some illumination. Perhaps you get an idea, an answer, some clarity. And then you walk back out, bringing that back out into the world. Now sometimes it works that way, sometimes it doesn't. There was a woman I heard say, well, it just doesn't do anything for me. I mean, it makes me feel peaceful. That's all. It makes me feel peaceful. And that's kind of the goal of mindfulness practice, right? It makes, eh, 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 makes me feel peaceful. So it's not magic. It's not like reading your fortune, but it is a way to quiet the mind. I personally am not good at seated meditation. I don't do well at seated meditation. But a walking meditation, there's something about the rhythmic back and forth, the turning back and forth that quiets my mind and allows whatever wisdom may be there to get past my own chatter. So now back to my story. I'm working out a problem, I got a little resentment, it's kind of digging in there, I've worked up a good head of steam, I told somebody off in my head. And then at a stoplight, I wondered how I could apply the metaphor of this, of the labyrinth to this situation. I thought, okay, I released whatever was that steam that I had built up. I said out loud what I might not say in person. And I got to the center and I asked myself, I got to the stoplight. That's, let's call that my center for the moment. I finished that release. And I got to the center and I could ask myself, well, kid, do you feel better or worse? And I didn't feel better. I had kind of charged myself up with some negative energy. It wasn't magic. It wasn't some spirit coming in and telling me, don't do that, or that's sinful, or that's wrong, or we don't behave that way. It was actually me working out and then asking a question, how does this serve me? And so now I return to that problem and can think, well, that's not how I want to deal with it. That's not how I want to resolve this little resentment. That's not how I want to be in relationship with a person. It's not an exact parallel, but somehow my experience of the labyrinth helped me use that tool and apply it to how do I want to be centered in my life. And I think that's part of what being in this community does. We say that we encourage each other to spiritual growth, mindfulness growth. How does your story 
fit into this threefold path? How do we release, find illumination, and integrate it out into the world? How can our mindfulness practices help us be more centered? I'm curious. I don't know. And but I think mindfulness is the way that I want to try to do this. I'm thinking of other ways that we can use this metaphor of mindfulness to metaphorically find our center. For example, my yoga teacher says that all of these positions that we do are ways to breathe in, in odd positions. They're ways to find our breath. Isn't that a metaphor for what we do in difficult times? In grief, to find our breath. In conflict in relationship, to find our breath. We can do that when we practice yoga on the regular or other mindfulness breathing techniques. That's why it helps if we practice on the regular then when we need those skills, they're there and available to us. Does that make sense? That's how it feels in my head. I'm wondering how else we might use this metaphor for other applications, how our mindfulness work helps us in grief work, in challenges around our employment, in working out financial issues, how does our mindfulness practice, whether it's the labyrinth or something else, help us engage justice issues, especially climate justice issues? How does it help us navigate inequity? Oftentimes, I think we think of our justice work over here and our mindfulness work over here. But it is the integration of the two, the integration of the two, that makes each stronger. How can my justice practice strengthen my mindfulness practice? And how does my mindfulness practice strengthen my desire for justice? That's the question that I think is so interesting as humanists, because we don't think that something is going to come down and solve the problems. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and we'd best be mindful and centered lest we approach these problems with hubris. I invite you in the coming days and weeks to think about what are your mindfulness practices and how, how can you strengthen them? And how do they support the other areas of your life? See if this metaphor works for you. Find out if there's a way to engage with releasing, with finding illumination, and with integrating that back into the world. And as you think of it, I will invite you at noon today, after we get a little bite downstairs to eat, to come back up to this space to experience our FUS labyrinth. We put it out at the winter solstice, have for many years. But if you're not attending to then, or if you've got other things that you're doing at winter solstice and don't have time to walk the labyrinth, it's available to you today, and we'll be here, and you can take as long as you like on it. And there will also be some finger labyrinths available, some paper labyrinths that you can trace this image, that you can trace with your finger if you wish, don't wish to walk. Mindfulness is a place to play. A labyrinth is a place to play. It turns a particular spot on the ground into a special marked out place on the planet where we can bring our full selves, our full consciousness, and then see what happens. May it be so.